This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Overnight airstrikes in the Gaza Strip tragically ended the lives of seven people traveling in a humanitarian aid convoy. Meanwhile, Israel says it's put forward a new ceasefire proposal for Hamas to review. NTD's Jason Perry has the war update. These vehicles are what remain of a humanitarian aid convoy that was helping to deliver aid to the Gaza Strip. We suddenly saw the strike on them and we ran to evacuate them. What can we say? May God bless them, whoever they were. The convoy belonged to the World Central Kitchen, a humanitarian aid organization that has been working closely with Israel over the last few months to help deliver aid to Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Tuesday said that Israel Defense Forces unintentionally struck the aid vehicles, which killed seven aid workers. We are checking this thoroughly. We are in touch with the governments and we will do everything for this not to happen again. World Central Kitchen released a statement saying the aid convoy had just left a warehouse in central Gaza after unloading over 100 tons of humanitarian aid brought by sea and that the convoy had coordinated their movements with the Israeli military. On Tuesday, IDF spokesperson Daniel Hagari gave condolences to the families and the entire World Central Kitchen organization. We will get to the bottom of this and we will share our findings transparently. In another development, Iran has vowed revenge on Israel after an airstrike hit an alleged Iranian embassy in Syria, killing two Iranian generals and five military advisors. But Israel said it was not an embassy that was hit. It was a military building, an Al-Quds force military building disguised as a civilian building in Damascus. Also on Tuesday, Israel's prime minister posted on X that a new ceasefire proposal has been presented for Hamas to review. Jason Perry, NTD News. The White House said today that there is no evidence that Israel intended to kill the aid workers. A rare phone call amid heightened tensions, President Biden raising concerns to China's Xi Jinping over TikTok, Taiwan and China's hacking schemes. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more. It's the first time that Biden and Xi talked after Biden last met Xi in November and called him a dictator after their in-person meeting in San Francisco. And this time around, the White House says the two had a candid conversation lasting for about an hour and 45 minutes. The two talked about AI, climate change, and maintaining open lines of communication, but Biden also raised concerns over a variety of issues. Here's what the White House was saying about some of them. Watch. President Biden also emphasized the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, and he reaffirmed the importance of the rule of law and freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. He raised concerns over the PRC's support for Russia's defense industrial base. In addition to these, the White House says President Biden also raised concerns about China's unfair trade practices and the Chinese ownership of the app TikTok. And a senior administration official told us right before the call that President Biden is committed to also raising concerns about China's hacking operations targeting U.S. critical infrastructure. And just last week, the U.S. indicted and sanctioned several Chinese hackers for allegedly launching a massive state-backed hacking operation targeting U.S elected officials, political candidates, and even campaign personnel, among others. And today, the White House said this about Biden's warning to Xi against interfering with the U.S. in 2024 elections. Watch. We've been uh, uh, clear consistently, even going back to the November meeting in California, about our concerns over uh, our own election security um, and, and efforts by certain actors, including some from the PRC, to, to affect that. 
And just earlier this month, the U.S. intelligence community warned that China may be trying to interfere with the U.S. in 2024 elections. And a senior administration official told us that even if China says they won't do so, it's not enough to take them at their word. Meanwhile, after today's call between Biden and Xi, and Secretary of State Antony Blinken will travel to China in the coming weeks, and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will be there in the coming days. And just next week, President Biden will host the leaders of the Philippines and Japan here at the White House, in which the topic of China's influence will surely come up as a top issue. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. A school shooting in Finland today. A 12-year-old shot and wounded three other students. Police say one was killed and the two others are at the hospital. They also say they took the suspect into custody after the student fled by foot. The country's public broadcaster reports the handgun was licensed to a close relative of the shooter. The school is in a suburb of Helsinki. It has almost 900 students and staff. Former President Trump is campaigning in key swing states today. NTD's Jack Bradley is in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where Trump is holding a rally. Jack, what is the latest in the Trump campaign? Well, Tiff, uh, I'm here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and Trump has just begun his remarks right behind me here uh, to this fired up crowd, uh, as always at these Trump rallies. Um, we're in the uh, KI Convention Center, and it is filled to the brim with people. Uh, behind me, there's just people standing behind the stage here. And uh, Wisconsin is having their primaries today. It is a swing state, and it's an open primary, so you don't have to register a certain party to vote here. Uh, earlier today, tr uh, Trump was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, giving a speech on how illegal immigration is impacting uh, people up living at the Great Lakes. Um, he said that uh, he brought up this instance of this one 25-year-old woman who was allegedly murdered by uh, a previously deported Mexican national. Take a look. Beautiful young woman was savagely murdered by an illegal alien criminal. Under the Trump administration, this monster had been deported, thrown out of the country, wasn't going to be able to come back. When President Biden took office in 2021, he reversed many of Trump's policies on the border. And as we've seen, many uh, of the, the surge in illegal immigration has been breaking records. Uh, now, according to a March poll by the Associated Press North Center for Public Affairs Research, about two thirds of Americans now disapprove of President Biden's handling of the southern border. And uh, they also include four in 10 Democrats who disapprove of Biden's handling there, 55 percent of black adults and 73 percent of Hispanics. Now, Mexico's president has promised to help the U.S. in curbing its illegal immigration as long as it meets certain criteria. Uh, they want the U.S. to reduce illegal border cross. They want the U.S. to lift sanctions on Cuba and Venezuela, provide $20 billion to countries in Latin America and um, in the Caribbean, and grant legal status to some Mexican immigrants in the U.S. And Trump said that this shows a blatant lack of respect. Take a look. Mexico is now asking for $20 billion a year to a year to even sit down and talk to these people. They wouldn't ask me for that. $20 billion a year. Have you seen that? I don't know, Mike Rogers. I think we're going to have to stop that. Now, on the other end of this, President Biden has uh, said that Congress needs to take action, and it's that their responsibility to curb the illegal immigration crisis. Um, and just yesterday, the Biden campaign took aim at Trump, saying that uh, to remind voters about the January 6th Capitol breach. Now, Biden won Wisconsin in 2020 by 0.6 percentage points. Trump won Wisconsin in 2016 by a little bit bigger of a margin there. Um, and the results in Wisconsin will be will come out uh, at 8 p.m. Central Time here. Um, back to you, Tiffany. Jack, thank you for that update. The White House today responding to former President Trump's Michigan event, accusing him of using dangerous rhetoric. But some are now pointing to an apparent double standard in the allegation. Entity's Arian Pazdar has more. We can't allow that. The White House on Tuesday criticizing former President Trump for naming his speech at a Michigan campaign event, Biden's border bloodbath. In the way that this violent rhetoric is being used, it is being used to tear our country apart. President Biden himself has used the term bloodbath in the past. During the 2020 presidential primary race, Biden was running against Bernie Sanders. Biden was talking about online attacks from Sanders supporters when he reportedly said, 
What we can't let happen is let this primary become a negative bloodbath. On Tuesday, a reporter asked whether using the term is okay for Biden, but not for Trump. What the president was talking about during the primary was not to allow it to be the words and, and the primary and that election to become negative. Two different, two different things. They're not the same. They're not the same. And your question is disingenuous. Trump's Tuesday speech comes as immigration is shaping up to be a key issue in this year's presidential election. A new poll by the Associated Press shows that 68 percent of Americans disapprove of the way Biden is handling immigration. Only 31 percent say they approve. And an update on the immigrants who stormed the Texas border. On Monday, NTD reported that a judge had to let almost 40 of the suspects go. That was because the DA's office didn't file the papers correctly. But the New York Post now says that ICE now detained all of those suspects. In total, over 200 immigrants have reportedly been charged with rioting for storming the border. ICE reportedly plans to start deportation proceedings against each of them. And lastly, a judge is dismissing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis from a lawsuit. Back in 2022, Florida flew around 50 illegal immigrants from Texas to Martha's Vineyard. Civil rights groups later sued DeSantis, the state of Florida, the company that chartered the flights, and others. DeSantis has now been dismissed from the suit, but litigation continues with other defendants. The judge says that they exploited the illegal immigrants in a scheme to help the DeSantis campaign. Arian Pastar, NTD News. And Trump posted bond in his New York civil fraud case. And in the New York hush money case, a judge expanded a gag order. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has the story. Trump on Monday posted a $175 million bond as he appeals the judgment against him in the New York civil fraud case. A state appeals court last month lowered the bond amount by several hundred million dollars. Trump's attorneys previously argued that covering the original $464 million bond was not feasible. The bond will pause any action that State Attorney General Letitia James could take against Trump's properties in response to the judgment. In February, a judge found Trump liable for overvaluing his wealth. Trump has appealed the verdict. Today, justice has been served. Today, we prove that no one is above the law, no matter how rich. The bond will hold until at least September, when the state appeals court also sets a schedule to hear Trump's appeal. If the court upholds the judgment, Trump will have to pay the whole sum, along with interest. But if Trump wins, he will be refunded the amount he has posted now. A judge in Trump's so-called hush money trial expanded a gag order against the former president. The order from last week prevented Trump from making statements about witnesses, jurors, prosecutors, court staff, and their families. Now the order will also include family members of the court and the Manhattan DA. The case revolves around Trump's alleged payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels, which prosecutors say violated campaign finance laws. Trump has denied having an affair with Daniels or any wrongdoing in the case. The gag order comes after Trump made a social media post mentioning Judge Mershon's daughter, Lauren Mershon. She's a Democratic political consultant. Trump wrote on Truth Social that she, quote, makes money by working to get Trump. Judge Mershon said this will make everyone involved in the case fear for their loved ones and interfere in the administration of justice. Trump's lawyers argued that his comments are protected under the First Amendment. They oppose any expansion of the original order. They wrote that Trump's comments about Judge Mershon's daughter should be understood as criticism of the court and not a personal attack. They argued that criticism of government is constitutionally protected and asked the court not to grant the gag order extension. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Turning now to the Trump classified documents case, today attorneys are expected to submit proposed jury instructions in response to Judge Eileen Cannon's unusual request for the submissions. We turn now to our legal correspondent Arlene Richards to find out what Cannon could be looking for. Arlene, thanks for joining us. What specifically did the judge ask for? So she specifically asked for proposed jury instructions on two different scenarios. And what she's focusing on and what the uh, defendants and the prosecution are focusing on are counts one through 32 out of 38 counts. And those counts address the case, the heart of the case, basically from the time that the documents were transported from the White House to, to Mar-a-Lago, from the time that he had conversations with the National Archives, and on to when the FBI actually came and searched his Mar-a-Lago residence. Hmm. And why did she order this for only counts one through 32? So this stems from two motions to dismiss that the defendants filed, in which they asked for one motion, they asked that the case be dismissed because they said that the 
the law that's being used by the prosecution is too vague, and that law is the Espionage Act. And they said that there are certain terms within that law that are not very clear, such as unauthorized possession. They said, what does that mean? Who is it that can authorize the President of the United States on whether or not he can take classified documents out of the office? And the other motion was a motion to dismiss based on the fact that they said that was the wrong law. Espionage Act is not the proper law to be, to be are used in this case, that it should be the Presidential Records Act. And under the Presidential Records Act, Trump had the authority to decide what documents he could take out, even if they were classified, based on what previous presidents have done. And what the, what the judge is saying is, well, these are two competing scenarios here. How are we going to instruct the jury at the time of trial? On the one hand, uh, you know, the jury would be allowed to look at the classified documents under the Espionage Act, and they would be able to determine whether or not those were documents he was allowed to have. And, and under the prosecution's theory of that, he would have just been a regular citizen, not the president. And under the other scenario, under the Presidential Records Act, he would have had full authority, and so the, the jury would not be allowed to look at those documents. And so these are the two scenarios she's trying to figure out how that would play out. Hmm. Now, I've heard that this is an unusual move to order jury instructions so early. What are jury instructions and when are they usually prepared? <laughs> yeah, so as I said, they're usually prepared at the end of the trial. After all the testimony and evidence has been completed, then the judge will instruct the jury on what they have to do. It's kind of like a charge. She will explain to them what the law is, how they are to apply the law to the facts, and come up with a decision as to who has actually proven their case. And it's unusual here, of course, because she's asking for it before the trial has even started. And also, she's asking for two jury instructions, not just one. So some legal experts are saying they think that Jack Smith, the prosecutor, may object to this uh, today, later today, because I, I didn't see that they had submitted yet. But he may object to actually submitting these jury instructions because his indictment says nothing about the Presidential Records Act, so why should he have to prepare those instructions? So we'll have to see what happens later today. I think they have until midnight tonight to submit them. Fascinating. Well, Arlene, thank you so much for that update. All right, thank you. More surveillance footage of the January 6th Capitol breach will be available soon. House Speaker Mike Johnson gave an update on the new tapes on Newsmax. We're releasing them in large batches. I think 13,000 of the 40,000 hours have been released so far. And the only reason they're not all out there, I wish I could wave a wand and do it all today, is that it takes a while to upload and process them. If you do the math, it's five years worth of video tape. Johnson said that thousands of hours have been uploaded so far and the tapes will be available as soon as possible. After being elected speaker last year, Johnson said that he would release all 40,000 hours of January 6th footage. He added that the tapes have not been released in full because it takes time to process and upload the videos. You can already watch the first batch of the footage on the Rumble page of the House Administration Committee. Trump last year praised Johnson for releasing the tapes. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Four states are holding primary elections tonight. Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island and Wisconsin. Joining me now to discuss the races as well as President Biden's campaign is David Carlucci. He's a Democratic strategist and a former New York state senator. David, thanks so much for joining us now. Key races in tonight's primaries with the nominees down to Trump and Biden. How do tonight's results fit into what we can expect in the general come November? Well, it's a snapshot of what to look at. It's better data than the polls we've been receiving, but it's not the tell-all tale, right? Uh, I, I voted early in New York. Um, I actually took my kids to the library today and we saw some of the election inspectors and they said it's way under in terms of the amount of people coming out. Um, early voting, we had 100,000 people vote in New York State. Uh, given there's 20 million people in New York. So I think it's very much under the radar. So I wouldn't read too much into these primary contests, given that we know who the nominees are going to be. Um, I think people on the right are going to try to, you know, throw some bow arrows at uh, the fact that there might be some blank votes in New York and uncommitted votes in other states. Um, but when you look closely at that, you see Biden having more of a problem with the far left and you see Donald Trump having more of a problem with the uh, with the middle. And as we get closer to the election, this is a race to the middle for both Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And I think being 
uh, more of the favored for moderate candidates um, or, or voters is going to be where you want to be heading into November. Hmm. On that note, Biden has been skipping the Beltway media for ones with specific audiences, like the one he did in New York recently with a comedy podcast. Now, what do you make of Biden's strategy? Is this a winning one? Well, I think it is. I think he's got to talk about his record, about what he's accomplished. Uh, he has a major fundraising advantage over Donald Trump. And you see a rollout of um, people that used to work closely with Donald Trump, like his uh, former chief of staff, um, Donald Trump's uh, um, joint chiefs um, of staff, um, uh, John Bolton, uh, the list goes on and on. His secretary of defense, uh, his head counsel, the communications director, all saying they will not be voting for Donald Trump. Um, so the fact that Biden has this strong fundraising advantage, um, the fact that now you have a clear choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And you just hear more and more rhetoric coming from Donald Trump. His campaign stumps, if you call it that, he's had very few since he's become the official nominee uh, or secured the enough uh, delegate, uh, delegate votes. Um, but every time Donald Trump gives a speech, it has to be walked back, right? You have people that have to clarify what Donald Trump really meant. And that's a real problem for the people in the middle that haven't made up their mind yet. Yes, most people have already made up their mind, but there's very few, um, but those are the most precious votes there. Um, and as they're trying to decide who to vote for, as Donald Trump just makes all of these gaffes and all of these claims um, that are just not true, um, like the fact he says we wouldn't have inflation if he were president, or Hamas would have, in, would have not invaded Israel, or Russia would not have invaded Ukraine. You've heard all of him say this in the past week, and voters know it's just fictitious because he just says whatever he wants with no plan to back it up. We did see President Biden in the White House giving different statements on the Transgender Day of Awareness over Easter weekend. Now, Democratic strategist James Carville was warning over the weekend that the Democratic Party is actually losing young minority voters. He was saying they're leaving in droves. How crucial is this voting bloc for Biden to win? Yeah, it's, it's crucial. There's no question about it. Uh, Biden one with young voters and minority voters uh, overwhelmingly to Donald Trump. Um, and I think the issue here is that people are not paying attention. Some of the strongest data that I've pulled from these least, these recent pollings um, show that about 40 percent of the electorate, believe it or not, are not engaged in the election right now. They're not following it like you and I are following it and, and your, your uh, watchers are following it. Um, 40 percent. So what that means to me is many of these voters, particularly young voters, as it comes into focus, as they learn about where the candidates actually stand, uh, that they will start to come back to Joe Biden. Yes, many of these voters, it's the first time they'll be voting in a presidential election. So Joe Biden does have his work cut out for him. Um, but with that fundraising advantage and the fact that he has surrogates that can stump for him, uh, puts him in a good position. It's nothing to take for granted. I think these are worrying poll numbers for Joe Biden, but it does not mean that he's uh, too far behind to pull it back in and to win the election in November. David Carlucci, Democratic strategist, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Thank you. Authorities have opened a channel for small vessels in the Baltimore Harbor seven days after the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Demolition experts continue debris removal in a race to reestablish normal transit through the waterway. NTD's Luis Martinez has the latest. A barge carrying jet fuel on its way to Dover Air Force Base in Delaware was the first ship to bypass the container ship Dolly and the wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in the Baltimore Harbor. Demolition crews have lifted at least 200 tons of debris to clear a path, but the newly opened channel only allows for smaller vessels to transit through. The temporary channel will be marked with government lights to aid navigation and will have a controlling depth of 11 feet. Neo Panamax container ships like the Dolly, the ship that struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge in the Baltimore Harbor, require at least 35 feet of depth to transit. The road to opening the waterway completely will be a colossal feat. 
Engineers, demolition experts, and divers are coordinating the removal of the debris that is equivalent to removing something the size of the Statue of Liberty from the Baltimore Harbor. So we're continuing to dive on that. We've got advanced sonar capability out there helping us map that, but it's turning out to be more challenging than we originally thought it might be just in trying to determine how they are tangled and how we're going to eventually cut through them. The federal government, through its emergency relief fund, will pay for 90% of the cleaning and reconstruction of the bridge. Senator Van Hollen, the Democrat from Maryland, believes Congress should appropriate additional funds to pay for the remaining 10%. Uh, with respect to the, the remainder, uh, if you go back uh, to the time of the Minneapolis bridge uh, collapse, Congress, within a very short period of time, uh, overwhelmingly uh, said the federal government uh, should help uh, a great American city. We believe that we should come together again as Americans, put aside you know, party labels and get it done. The White House has announced that President Biden will visit Baltimore on Friday and that the president remains in close contact with lawmakers to facilitate additional assistance. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. On the West Coast, heavy rain over the weekend caused a part of California's iconic Highway 1 to collapse. And across the country, other states are expecting severe storms, tornadoes, and snow. And today's Eileen Eng has the details. Motorists crept along one lane of a scenic stretch of California's iconic Highway 1 on Monday after a giant chunk of it collapsed into the ocean following heavy weekend rains. It stranded as many as 1,600 people in the coastal community of Big Sur. The collapse occurred Saturday about 17 miles south of Monterey, and traffic backed up for miles in both directions. Convoys of vehicles resumed Monday morning for one lane of the highway, but most of the people trapped in Big Sur were allowed to leave when a single lane was reopened Sunday after being closed overnight. The famous route has seen frequent closures because of collapses, mud flows, and rock slides during severe weather. Across the eastern half of the U.S., the threat of a severe weather outbreak grows as tens of millions of people face dangerous hail and destructive tornadoes starting Tuesday morning. According to the Storm Prediction Center, parts of Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana are at most risk. Ohio hasn't had a tornado threat this substantial in more than 10 years. Alabama and western Georgia, north to parts of Indiana and West Virginia, could also see tornadoes. More than 75 million people are at risk for severe thunderstorms from the Gulf Coast to Great Lakes. Many could see damaging winds of 60 to 80 miles per hour and hail ranging from the size of quarters to baseballs. Over 17 million people from Illinois to Maryland also face a flood threat from the storms. The tornado threat will lessen Wednesday as storms shift east, but there is still a risk for severe thunderstorms with damaging winds and hail in parts of the mid-Atlantic and Florida. The wintry mix is expected to bring snow to Michigan and Wisconsin Wednesday and Thursday. Polling shows independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. could impact the 2024 race. Kennedy is now the highest polling third-party candidate in over 30 years. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more. Polling from the Hill and Decision Desk HQ found Kennedy averaging just under 10 percent using results from over 100 polls. Trump averaged 41.5 percent, Biden just over 39 percent. A Harris X Forbes poll last month had Trump with a three-point lead over Biden at 46 to 43 percent and 11 percent unsure. Kennedy had 12 percent when added to the race, while Trump maintained a three-point lead. A Real Clear Politics national average poll has Trump two and a half points over Biden in a five-way race, with Kennedy at around 10 percent. Independent candidates Cornell West and Jill Stein came in just under 2 percent. A Quinnipiac University poll last week had Biden with a three-point lead in a one-on-one -on -one rematch with Trump. Trump came out leading by one point when Kennedy and other candidates are in. Biden in a Reuters Ipsos poll last month had a three-point lead over Trump in a head-to-head -head matchup, but Trump took a one-point lead with Kennedy at 16 percent. Kennedy told CNN Monday he believes Biden is a bigger threat to democracy than Trump for being the first president in history to use federal agencies to censor political speech in his opponent. You know, I can say that because I just won a case in the Federal Court of Appeals and now before the Supreme Court. It shows that he started censoring not just me. 37 hours after he took the oath of office, he was censoring me. The 2024 hopeful has a long way to go to catch up to either major candidate and needs a minimum 15 percent national polling average to qualify for a presidential debate. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. 
Joining us now to dive into the races, especially in the swing states, is Brianna Lyman, elections correspondent at The Federalist. Brianna Lyman, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Now, Trump is campaigning in two key battleground states today, Michigan and Wisconsin. He won both eight years ago, but has been struggling to gain ground since then. How crucial are these states for him to win? Yeah, both of these states are crucial for Biden and Donald Trump. And I think in particular, probably uh, Biden more so than Trump, because Donald Trump, when he won Wisconsin in 2016, that was the first time since, I believe, 1984, definitely the preceding 20 years, but I believe it was 1984, that a Republican won uh, the Wisconsin electoral votes. And so I don't know if that was necessarily part of Donald Trump's pathway to victory in 2016 that his team was banking on. It was just like a, 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 you know, a happy bonus. And so if he loses Wisconsin this time around, I don't know if that'll necessarily prevent him from getting to the White House. I'd also remind viewers to remember that, look, Wisconsin had a lot of issues in 2020. First of all, you had people who were getting to vote via absentee ballot and didn't have to provide voter ID. You had the expansion of ballot drop boxes, which helps Democrats. And you also had Mark Zuckerberg. He poured these Zuckerbucks into local election offices that then used that money disproportionately in Democrat-led areas, right? So it helped increase voter turnout for Democrats. So Donald Trump kind of had a lot of things stacked against him. In Michigan in particular, you know, Donald Trump, when he won in 2016 and beat Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton underperformed in two important counties, Genesee and Wayne, okay? Those are predominantly black counties. Joe Biden is hemorrhaging the black vote right now. So if he continues to hemorrhage black voters and underperforms in counties that he needs to win, places like Michigan, on top of losing progressives who are anti-Israel, he could really set himself up poorly and Donald Trump will have the opportunity to make that gap smaller and win those states. Hmm. Now, Trump is set to speak about what he calls the border bloodbath, while Biden is going to be focusing on abortion. What do you make of these different approaches when it comes to getting voters out to the polls? I think abortion is not necessarily a kitchen table issue the way Democrats have tried to portray it. And, you know, Politico did an analysis recently, and since Roe versus Wade was overturned, there were five um, abortion ballot referendums that they looked at. And it didn't significantly increase Democratic turnout, right? It also didn't significantly increase Republican turnout um, either way. So Democrats are not necessarily showing out in droves for abortion. And polling suggests that the economy, crime, and immigration remains a top three priority. And I think that as a lot of places like, for instance, New York City, Chicago, where Democrat-heavy areas are seeing this influx of illegal immigrants using and draining city resources, they're, re they're more reluctant to vote for a Democrat just because they're a Democrat. But they're actually saying, what is this politician going to do to either further the crisis I'm seeing in my city or, or stop it? Now, independent third-party candidate RFK Jr. is back in the headlines. This is after he said that the Biden administration, when it comes to censorship, is arguably a worse threat to democracy than Trump. Now, who is Kennedy likely to pull more voters from, Trump or Biden? I think definitely Joe Biden. And, you know, a concern here is that Joe Biden is running a three-way race right now. Actually, maybe even a four-way race, right? Because there's Donald Trump, there's RFK, and there's the couch. And I think a lot of voters who may not want to vote for Joe Biden and don't want to vote for Donald Trump look at RFK as that alternative candidate, or they look at the couch as just an alternative option on November 5th. And RFK, he does appeal to a lot of independents because he acknowledges the problems with both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, not that I agree with his, uh, some of the stuff he says, but he does appeal to moderates who don't see Joe Biden as their future leader. Now, there's also been a lot of talk to one of your earlier points, too. How many are noting the Democrats know how to win, whether that's unity in Congress or banding together behind policies or when it comes to getting the vote out, election ballots, all that. Now, Turning Point Action is trying to counter that on the conservative side with something called chase the vote. In your view, is this enough to impact the Democratic, say, election machine? I don't think it'll be enough. I think it's a great start. Uh, but Democrats have been kind of focusing on this since 2016, right? They, they looked at their poll data and they said, why did we lose? Um, and in doing so, they pushed mail-in ballots, they pushed ballot harvesting. And Republicans have shied away from things like ballot harvesting because it's dangerous. There's a lot of risk with it. And they wanted to essentially take the moral high ground. Uh, but I think they're kind of realizing it's coming back to bite them because while it's legal, Democrats are successfully using it. So with this new change of leadership um, at the RNC, they are pushing for Republicans to use all legal measures, which is great. But you have to now convince the voters themselves to take part in that. Brianna Lyman, thank you so much for your time.
A first of its kind law in the U.S. dealing with illegal drug possession is being reversed. Oregon lawmakers voted to roll back a voter approved measure. They're making a personal use possession back into a misdemeanor punishable by up to six months in jail. Democratic Governor Tina Kotek signed the new law Monday. 58% of Oregon voters approved the old law in 2020, but officials haven't fully implemented it. The old law made the personal use possession of illicit drugs such as heroin, cocaine and methamphetamines only punishable by a ticket and a maximum fine of $100. Supporters argue that treatment is better than jail in helping people who are addicted, but it would cost millions of dollars and deadly overdoses have been on the rise. The Florida Supreme Court's upholding the state's 15-week abortion ban. That means a later passed six-week ban can soon take effect. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the ruling. A six-week ban passed in 2023 was written so that it would not take effect until a month after the 2022 15-week abortion ban was upheld. But in a separate ruling on Monday, the court also approved an initiative that would enshrine abortion access in Florida state constitution. The initiative will appear on the November ballot, meaning Floridians have an opportunity to undo the abortion ban. The amendment to limit government interference with abortion would make abortions before fetal viability constitutionally protected. There is no universal consensus on the timeline behind fetal viability, but many consider it to be roughly 23 to 24 weeks after the point of conception. It would also apply in cases when necessary to protect the mother's health. Ballot initiatives for constitutional amendments must receive at least 60% of the vote to pass, according to Florida state laws. The group sponsoring the 2024 ballot initiative is Floridians Protecting Freedom. The group opposing the abortion access initiative is Florida Voice for the Unborn. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers has vetoed legislation that would prohibit transgender athletes from competing in high school sports. The bill was passed in the state's GOP-controlled legislature in a party-line vote. Wisconsin Republicans said the measure would maintain fairness in women's sports, but the governor had vowed to veto the bill before its passage. It takes a two-thirds majority to override a veto, but neither chamber currently has it. Since 2020, at least 24 states have introduced laws banning transgender athletes from competing on school sports teams. Welcome back, I'm Tiffany Meyer. In case you didn't know, Google's incognito search mode is hardly incognito at all. It still tracks everything you do and keeps the data. NTD's Arlene Richards gives us the latest developments in a 2020 class action lawsuit against the tech giant. Google will destroy browsing history for millions of people as part of a settlement from a 2020 class action lawsuit. The lawsuit says Google misled users, making them think incognito mode meant private browsing, when in fact Google was watching it all, including web pages, people visited, communications, and personal information. Internal Google exchanges reveal Chief Marketing Officer Lorraine Tuhill warning CEO Sundar Pichai that incognito mode is not truly private thus requiring really fuzzy hedging language that is almost more damaging. Google now has a fuller disclosure on its incognito mode homepage. Chrome won't save your browsing history, cookies, and information entered in forms, but your activity may still be visible to websites you visit, employers or schools, and your internet service provider. To browse privately, experts recommend using privacy-focused search engines, such as DuckDuckGo or StartPage, to make your search queries private, and using VPN or virtual private network to hide your browsing from your internet service provider. In just a few days, a total solar eclipse will dazzle tens of millions of viewers as it passes over North America. Day will turn into night as the moon perfectly positions itself between Earth and the sun. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the latest. Designed. Next Monday's total solar eclipse will be a spectacular show. The moon will be extra close to Earth, providing long and intense periods of darkness. The sun should be more active, with the potential for dramatic bursts of plasma. Usually twice a year, the moon will come directly in between the sun and the Earth, blocking out some or all 
of its light. And on the 8th of April, what uh, a few very lucky people are going to be able to see across parts of the world is a total solar eclipse. The phenomenon will begin on Mexico's Pacific coast in the morning before traveling through 15 states from Texas to Maine. The eclipse will exit in eastern Canada and into the Atlantic Ocean by late afternoon. When it happens, you need to be in very specific places. In fact, if you want to see a total solar eclipse, you need to be within a very specific region known as the path of totality. Essentially, that is the place where the moon's shadow is passing over the surface of the Earth. The period of totality will last up to four and a half minutes in some spots. Essentially, what they'll see over the course of two hours or so is the moon very slowly moving across the face of the sun, sort of looking like it's almost eating the sun out of the sky. The next total solar eclipse will pass the northern edges of Greenland, Iceland and Spain in 2026. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Shinian Performing Arts successfully closed the curtains on five performances at the State Theatre New Jersey in New Brunswick. The Chinese classical dance company is now heading to New York City at Lincoln Center. Xinyan also received a proclamation for their efforts from the mayor of New Brunswick and an audience member called the performance timeless and something that the world needs right now. Watch. It's my distinct honor to proclaim with this proclamation March 28th, 29th, 30th and 31st of 2024 Shen Young Performance Days in the city of New Brunswick. Shen Performing Arts took theatergoers in New Brunswick, New Jersey on a journey through ancient China from March 28th through the 31st. Among audience members were Bert Barron from the Office of Public Information for the city of New Brunswick. He awarded Shen with a proclamation from Mayor Jim Cahill. Uh, visually and audibly stunning in every way possible, but at its heart it's a message of compassion and understanding that is timeless, that will never go out of style. It's something that the world could all use right about now. I think it's gorgeous. Uh, it's so seamless. The orchestra is doing a fantastic job. I think the conductor really feels the emotion behind the songs and carries that through each movement. It's it's beautiful. It is very well done. Everything is so beautiful. I keep using the same word, but it's just the colors and the, the dance and the music all together. I mean, everything is just, I, I want to think of a better word than beautiful, so maybe fabulous. Through story-based dance and music, Shenyang aims to revive 5,000 years of traditional Chinese culture and values from a time before communism. Audience members admired Shenyang's efforts and took note of a deeper message. I loved everything. I, I particularly enjoyed how the goodness showed through, uh, that it was warm and important. This entire show takes place before communism. And the theme it brings of compassion and caring, goodness and light, was very evident to me and one of the reasons I enjoyed it so much. I feel the energy, I feel uh, a message of peace and, uh, and harmony and, uh, and uh, being at peace with your, your soul and uh, I really like this message. Theater goers were mesmerized and highly recommended seeing Shen Ying. Incredible costumes, wonderful music, uh, timeless presentation, and this is a show that I would recommend to absolutely anyone. I'd say go. Go, go, go. Don't wait. Enjoy it. Yeah. We know, I know we did. We came as a family and we all enjoyed it. NTD News, New Brunswick, New Jersey. And that's all for today's news. For round-the-clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.